Okay, I've got a video. And actually, you'll notice that this video is labeled as being depression. <clears throat> but I don't think they're really talking about depression. I, I, think that the, the, I think they're talking about anxiety, and I think you'll agree. But what happens often with anxiety is that when people deal with anxiety for a long time and it's very functionally impairing, what happens? They become depressed. But the depression is secondary to the anxiety and having to deal with that, and it's exhausting. So that's what we're going to see here. From a very young age, I was always worrying, scared about things that you shouldn't really be scared about. When I was aged 11, I had what is known in the health service as a mental health crisis. Um, I missed months of school, I couldn't leave the house, I was having five to six panic attacks a day, and things became really, really awful. It's a numbness in your hands and feet, shaking, not being able to breathe, not being able to think about anything apart from what you're worrying about. You can wake up one morning and feel fine and then later in that day have a panic attack and you have no idea why. Your heart feels like it's going to burst out of your chest. It's, it's actually physically painful. I would say on average I have one to two a day, but when I'm having a really intense period of anxiety it can be as much as five and six, which is just... It's exhausting. So I didn't want to put pressure on my parents and I thought, no, I'll just keep it to myself. I've dealt with it my whole life. I can deal with it for, for a bit more. When I was 14, I thought I might actually commit suicide. And there's a difference between considering the idea and then actually thinking like how you'd plan and how you'd go about committing suicide. You can't tell whether something's just hormones, whether it actually is a mental illness. And I had that confusion in my mind. I was like, is this normal? But then it gets to the point where you're looking at sharp objects and thinking about the ways that you could kill yourself with it. And I think that that's when you realize that it's not hormones, that's, that's something much more serious because I don't think that's something that most teenagers would do. For me, things started to change when I was around 14, 15, when the sort of pressures of exams and GCSEs came. I wouldn't see my friends, I'd, I wouldn't be as sort of open, I wouldn't want to speak to anyone. I'd be up in, I'd, be, I'd come back from school and I'd just sit up in my room for hours upon end. Every day I'd wake up and my headaches would be there, it'd feel like a vice was gripping my head. It came to a point where I didn't want to get out of bed because they were so sort of painful. And once the headache started, I sort of found myself having nosebleeds probably two or three times a week. And then my hands started shaking. I thought I was going to die just mainly because I was looking at my symptoms on Google. And I sort of convinced myself that I had medical sort of problems. I thought I had a brain tumour. I didn't tell anyone for weeks upon weeks upon weeks. And then eventually um, it sort of just all got a little bit too much. I came home from school early because I couldn't face sort of the afternoon's lessons. I just, I just sat in my room and just sort of burst out crying. My parents were going through a lot of things at the time. My mum's health wasn't great. Because so I saw them struggling, I didn't want to have to go and whack another 10% on top of what they had. A lot of the way through primary school I was bullied. Um, coming to secondary school as well I was, I was bullied and that sort of took a big effect on sort of the way I behaved, the way I interacted with people um, and just generally how I felt about myself. I, I sort of let it build up to the extent that I was having headaches, nosebleeds, um, panic attacks. I wouldn't want to sort of go outside. I just want to come home from school, um, sit in my house, do what I do and then on the weekends I wouldn't even want to go shopping with my family. I think it's a massive problem. You know, we're not told that it's okay to talk about mental health. And I think that's the hardest part is when you're going through something like that, it's not going through what you're going through, it's finding a way to stop it and finding a way to talk about it. It's a big, big positive step that now the youngsters of this generation are actually understanding that it's okay to talk out about their problems. So it's about intervention when you're younger and sort of stopping your problems before they can develop into something sort of greater when you're older.
most days I just stay in bed and listen to music. I don't go out, I don't really socialise, I don't do any work. I just I either read or I listen to music because the effect it has on your ability to work, to concentrate, to focus, to persevere is enormous. I get really infuriated when people say, oh, just get yourself together because I don't think they realise quite how serious it is and quite how difficult it is to pick yourself up from that. You can't do it by yourself. You need help. Thoughts. You see how it was a lot of information about depression, but each of these kids was talking about panic attacks and physiological symptoms of anxiety and worries. Um, and, and that's when we talked earlier about how 40% of kids who have one mental disorder have a coexisting, this is a very common picture of that, where kids will struggle with anxiety for a really long time until it wears them down. They get hopeless, and when you're hopeless, you become depressed. So now they're dealing with anxiety, and they're dealing with depression, and maybe they're dealing with suicidal thoughts as well.